I want to just make note that we are a blessed people, aren't we? We are such a blessed people, um, and sometimes in our blessings, if we're not careful, we will take things for granted that God has given us, and we will we'll no longer see them as blessings. I've got five things I want to point out that in my life that I have taken for granted. Number one is parents. Parents are those types of people that, you know, they can push in sometimes and you can take them for granted, not realizing that God has given them to us as a gift. Secondly, a car battery. You can take your car battery for granted. I know that this week I was going to lunch with someone, got in my truck to turn it on, and it did not turn on. I was, had taken it for granted until it didn't work. Thirdly, plumbing, okay? Have you ever gotten in a shower and it was freezing cold because the hot water wasn't working? Or maybe you didn't even have water running, or you had water running backwards out of the toilet in, onto the floor. We can take our plumbing for granted. Also, we can take an automatic sliding glass doors for granted. You know, young people, there was a day when we had to open doors with our hands uh, going to the grocery store. Now those things are automatic, but if you ever walked up to it and it did not open, okay, then you realize you took that for granted. And the last thing I want to look at is an operating system on your computer. How many of you guys remember Windows 98? That was one of the most solid operating systems known to man, right? And then they went to, what was it, NT or was it 2000? Nobody knows, but -E. ME, oh, that's right, I forgot about ME, it was ME, okay, so anyway, but if you don't know what an operating system is, it is a, uh, a software program that enables the hardware to communicate with the software in the computer, and if a computer does not have an operating system, it cannot operate. I don't care how powerful that computer is, if it doesn't have an operating system, it is useless, it will crash, and, and it will be no good. And you know what, that is kind of what it's like to live your life without God. Now, I'm not saying that God is an operating system. He is God. He is the creator of all things. But like an operating system, when we take him for granted, we will miss him and miss what we were created for. And one of the reasons that we take him for granted is because often he operates like an operating system, or maybe the operating system operates like him. He operates in the background of our lives, and we're not aware what he's doing, and we can forget that he is there. And this morning, listen, if you want to daydream, daydream after this right here, what I'm about to say, if you don't take anything away from here but this, this is what I want you to get this morning, is that God is always at work in our lives. He's always at work in the lives of his people. Even though he, like an operating system, you may not see him. He is always, 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 always at work in the lives of his people. And the truth is he's actually in the, at work in the lives of everybody. Whether you are his child or not, whether you're someone that says, I don't believe in God, He's at work in your life. Whether you're saying, I don't want God, he's still at work in your life because he's calling you, just like he called the rest of us, to come to him and be reconciled to him through his son, Jesus. So whether or not you believe in him or not, God is always at work in our lives. And, you know, we're the church. Reach Life, we are the church. We've gathered in the name of Jesus, and we have heard the call of God, and we have responded to him by coming to him through Jesus Christ to worship him through his son. And we know that he loves us, don't we? We know that he loves us. We know that he cares about us. But even the church needs to be reminded of this truth, that God is always, God is always at work in the lives of his people. And if you've been with us uh, for the past few months, you know that we've been in the book of Genesis. And this morning we're going to jump back into Genesis chapter 24. And you'll remember that back in Genesis chapter 12, we were introduced to a guy whose name was Abram at the time. God later changes his name to Abraham, which means father of many. And when God came to Abraham, he made this covenant with him, and he promised him three things. He said, if you will leave your country, and if you will leave your people, I will bless you with three things. I will bless you with land, descendants, and a great name. In other words, through you, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And that blessing came to fruition when Jesus Christ came and he died for us on the cross. And now before we 
delve into our passage, I want to point out that we're going to see some culturally different practices in this passage that might kind of seem strange or foreign to the Western mind. We're going to see a love story unfold as a father seeks to find a bride for his son. It's a kind of boy meets girl type of story and that's full of drama and it ends with this romantic ending. But with all of this, all the things that are going to go on in this passage, I want us to be careful that we don't miss the primary point of this passage. And that is that God is sovereign. We don't want to miss his providence. This, is, this passage is about the providence of God, that he is always at work in the lives of his people. And Moses recorded this about over 3,000 years ago. He wrote this down for the Israelites so that they could be reminded of God's providence, how God is always at work in the lives of his people. And this is a truth that we need to hear this morning. Amen? Amen. Well, if you're taking notes, I've got three gospel truths that I want to pull out from this passage that you can hopefully take with you. And the first one is this, that as we are looking to see how God is at work in our lives, we need to understand that God involves his faithful servants. God involves his faithful servants. Now, in order to appreciate this truth, we need to make sure that we have the proper mindset with this. God involves his faithful servants. But we need to understand, as we're thinking about that, we need to understand that God is God. Okay? We need to understand that God is God. Now, what does it mean that God is God? Well, let me let God tell us what that means. Isaiah 46, 8 through 10 says, Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient time times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. As we are looking at the truth that God involves his, his faithful servants, we've got to not forget that God is God. There is no one like God. What he decrees will stand and he will accomplish his purposes with or without us. We need to understand that. And yet, here's, here's the mind blower. And yet he takes pleasure in inviting us all to be a part of what he is doing. We need to walk in that understanding as we understand that God involves his faithful servants. And all through this passage, we're going to see how God's sovereignty engages with man's responsibility to bring about his redemptive purposes. And so let's keep in mind that God has invited us to be involved in what he is doing as we enter into this passage, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 24. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had. Put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son. Now, Abraham is nearing the end of his, his life, his ministry, Scholars think that he's between 130 years old to 140 years old. He has lived a long and prosperous life. He's lived long enough to see that life has its ups and life has its downs. We've seen Abraham at his worst, and we've seen him at his best. But through it all, Abraham has come to know firsthand that God has always been at work in his life. He's come to know that, even when it didn't seem like God was there. 
And he's also come to know better the covenant that God made with him. Because God had promised him descendants. Remember that? That was one of the three, three things that God promised him? Descendants. And, and in Genesis 21, 12, he said, God said to Abraham, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. The Messiah that was promised back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when Adam and Eve blew it, and God said, I'm going to send a Messiah. That Messiah that was going to come through Abraham would come through Isaac. And so Abraham knew that his son, the son of promise, had to have a bride. And so Abraham, knowing this, calls his servant and commissions him to go and find a suitable bride. Now, many scholars believe that this servant, this oldest servant, was actually Eliezer from chapter 15 of Genesis. This was Abraham's chief servant. And, the, and Eliezer means God God, my help. And he's a, what you call a typology of the Old Testament. Now, an, a, an Old Testament typology is a person or a thing that points to a greater reality that will be revealed in the New Testament. And chapter 24 of Genesis is full of typologies. For example, Abraham. Abraham is the father who sent the servant into a distant land. He sent God, my help, into a distant land to find a bride suitable for his son to marry. Now, fast forward to the New Testament. God the Father sent the Holy Spirit, who Jesus calls the helper in John 15. He sent him into the world to call, to, to draw to himself, to draw to God, to draw to Jesus a church, a bride who would be married by the Son. This is a, a story, a true story, that teaches us the gospel, that points to the gospel. But let me ask you this. Why does Abraham not want his son to marry a Canaanite? Is it because he's racist? No, it's not. He's not concerned about ethnicity. He's concerned about spirituality. It's because the operating system of the Canaanites did not align with the operating system of Abraham. The Canaanites used Macintoshes. Abraham was a PC user. But they were a godless people. And Abraham did not want to allow his son to marry someone who was opposed to the God of heaven and earth. And because Abraham has the covenant in mind, he's thinking about the future generation. He wants to make sure that he is faithful to pass the baton of faith to his descendants. And so Abraham, listen, he participates and he cooperates with God, with the will of God. And he does not allow Isaac to be influenced by a godless Canaanite society that would turn his heart away from the Lord. This is very instructive. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins morals. Don't be deceived. Don't think, church, that you can hang around or be around and embrace ungodly influences into your life and into your heart and think that it won't influence you in the way that you love God. It matters who we call friend. It matters who we allow into our lives at a deep level. And, e and even greater than that, it matters who we choose to marry. And Abraham, knowing this, he doesn't want his son to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? I remember when I was in high school, that, that uh, verse got read, and a girl said, what does being married have, any, have to do with eggs, with egg yolks? I mean, I'm serious, she said that. And uh, I said, well, 
actually, it, it, it means about being yoked together unequally. And a yoke, we got a picture of it. It's a, it's a crossbar that binds two equal animals together. Because here's the thought. Two equal animals bound together are stronger and more productive than if they were apart. But if you bind two animals that are not equal together, <laughs> they're actually weaker. It would be better that those animals be apart than together. And this is such an, listen, this is such an important truth that we need to understand, that we need to embrace, especially when we're thinking about marriage. And when we're choosing a companion, we need to make sure that we are obeying God. And as I've studied scripture, there's only two requirements that God requires of his people. And the first one is that the person that you marry must be biologically of the opposite sex. That is something that God requires. Genesis chapter 2, it says, And a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Secondly, Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 7, 39, whoever a believer marries, they must be in the Lord. They must be a true disciple. Now, you may be going, well, why is that? Well, because if you truly love Jesus, aren't you going to want to share that with someone that also loves Jesus? How can you plow forward with someone that's not as engaged in the, the Lord that you are engaged in? And so if you're, if you're looking to get married, there are a million questions that you need to ask before you do that. You're going to need discernment. And you're going to want to make sure that you don't do it, make this decision by yourself. Hopefully you're in a, a place where you can be surrounded by godly people who, who will give you godly advice. And one of the things, one of the questions that you need to ask, you and that person need to ask is this. If we marry... If we marry, will us being yoked together accomplish more for the kingdom of God than if we were apart? That is a great que question to be asking. Do you, and do you have enough in common? Now, this is, this is another thing, which this, the Bible does not teach this explicitly. It's not a commandment, but I think there's wisdom in this. You need to make sure you have enough in common with that person who is in the Lord. For example, if you who speak English meet someone in China who does not speak English and you don't speak Chinese and yet they're a believer, you are free to marry that person. But would it be wise? Maybe not, probably not, because you would not be able to go together equally yoked. So we need to look at our culture we need to look at our upbringings and our preferences. All of these should play a role in whom we marry. And so I want to ask you this. Those of you who desire, who have not been married yet, who desire to get married, do you realize that God is at work in your life? Do you realize that God is at work in the person that you may marry already? Do you believe that? Do you trust in him? Do you believe that he will accomplish his purposes in you and for you if you will trust him? I want to encourage you to remember that God is and to believe that God is at work in your life right now, even if it doesn't feel like it. And Abraham trusted the Lord. And in verse 5, his servant has to decide if he's going to trust the Lord. It says in verse 5, The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. Part of the covenant is that Abraham's descendants are going to possess the land that they are living in. So Abraham does not want his son to be taken back to the land and maybe never come back into the promised land. And so, number one, we need to understand that God involves his faithful servants. And number two, that God leads his faithful servants. It says in verse 7 that the Lord, the God of heaven, and this is Abraham continuing to talk, the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, 
To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. He's telling his servant, listen, be faithful, knowing that God is going to lead you. He says this with great confidence because he knows that Isaac needs a wife. And, so he, and he also knows that God will provide it. But look at verse 8. This is very instructive. He says, but if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. Do you see what Abraham did here? He's leaving room that though he knows that God wants his son to have a bride, he's leaving room that maybe the plan that he's taking is not the right plan. It might not be exactly how God brings this about. And this is, this is very instructive because as we know the word of God, it calls us to do things. And if we will, listen, if we will step out in faith under the word of God, we can know that our God, because he's at work in our, in our life, if we're going in the wrong direction, he'll redirect us and point us in the way that we should go. God will direct us as we begin taking steps. He will lead us. And verse 9 says, So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. So we see, we're going to jump over uh, some verses here for time's sake, but basically the servant takes 10 camels and he goes on a journey. It was 450 miles one way to where he had to go through the desert. So this is not going to be an easy or comfortable or convenient trip. And you know, following God can often be that way, isn't it? The cross, I don't think, was comfortable. The cross was not convenient. And as we follow Christ, we need to understand that there are going to be times that are difficult as we follow the Lord. And after the servant gets to where he's going... He has his camels kneel down next to a well that's outside the city. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> this is where the women come out to, to get the water. And the question that you need to ask is, how would he know, how would he be able to discern what woman he should get? Well, it's crazy. He does something really strange. He prays. In verse 12, it says, O oh Lord, God of my master, please grant me success today. It's like he's saying, God, I've done my part. I'm looking to you. He says, please grant me success today and show me, show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Basically, he's saying, whatever girl I talk to that says, hey, here's a drink of water, let me also water your camels. Let that be the one who is Isaac's wife. And I want to point out something here in this, in this passage. This is a narrative. This passage that we're reading is a narrative. And usually when, when you're reading narratives, they are meant to be descriptive, not necessarily prescriptive. You, you, you following me? It, it, it describes how God interacted in the lives of his people in a specific situation. And we've got to be careful that as we're reading narratives that we don't take something that is descriptive and make it prescriptive. For example, in the New Testament, in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, it says that Jesus, it says that he rose early in the morning while it was still dark, and he departed and went out to a desolate place to pray. That's descriptive right there. But some people might take it and say, that means... You need to get up while it's still dark and go out into a desolate place 
and pray. Have, have you ever heard that? That can be taught that way, but that is, that's taking what is descriptive and making it prescriptive or making it a commandment. Now, what, is the, what, is, what can we learn from Jesus praying? That we need to pray. Jesus prayed, we need to pray. It just shows you how he prayed. And in this account right here, um, if you're a father, is this teaching us that if you want to get a bride for your uh, son, that you need to get a ser- hire a servant, put your hand under his thigh, and send him out and, and go get a bride? That is not what he's teaching there. We've got, also got to be careful that as this servant is praying a if-then prayer, that that's not, that's not what God is teaching us how to pray like that. We have to be careful this is a, because this is a very dangerous way to interpret Scripture. This is a narrative. And the question is, what is God trying to teach us in this narrative? What he's teaching is dependence on God. That's what he's teaching us through what the servant did. He prayed. He showed his dependence on God. And as we are seeking to participate in what God is doing, we need to be dependent on him. We need to be dependent on him to lead us. We need to be dependent upon him to guide us. And that means that we've got to be a prayerful people. That's what this passage is teaching here. And so it says that before the the servant finished praying, he looks up and he sees a young woman approaching. And in verse 16, it says, the young woman was very, I love this part of this passage. The young woman was very attractive in appearance a maiden in whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please give, me a, please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, drink, my Lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. And I love verse 20. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. Now this young virgin's name was Rebecca. And it's clear I hope it's clear to us that God has led the servant to her. But it's also clear that God has led her to the servant. Do you see that? God is, in his sovereignty, is bringing together his plan. But what did she have to do? What was she doing? She was just being faithful to do what God had called her to do in the day-to-day. She's not trying to do some great and big, mighty thing for God. She's just being faithful in the mundane. And as she is doing that, God brings about his redemptive purposes. And I love what this passage shows about Rebecca. It shows that she is a virtuous woman. She's humble, she's diligent, she's spunky. She goes the extra mile. Do you know how much a camel can drink? (laughs) 20 to 50 gallons of water. How big was her pitcher? I don't know, but it says that she watered all of them. How many of them were there? 10. What if it was just, what if they only drank 10 gallons? That's 100 gallons. It's ridiculous, but Rebecca joyfully performs remedial work for someone that she doesn't even know. And the servant looks at her and goes, that's the one. That is the one. And so the servant goes to, takes her and goes to her family. Long story short, they find out that this is, she is Abraham's relative. And everyone agrees, man, this is from God. God gives unity to his people. This shows how God is at work in the lives of his people and that he wants to involve us. He wants to lead us. And lastly, 
God accomplishes his work through his faithful servants. God, this is the part you've got to see. He involves, he leads, and he accomplishes his work through his faithful servants. Verse 61 says, Then Rebekah and her young women arose and rode the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had returned from a really hard city to pronounce and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. <laughs> Isaac went out into the field to meditate, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. God accomplishes his work. Mission accomplished. The covenant said that Isaac needed a wife. Abraham knew that, so Abraham was faithful to do what he knew to do. The servant was faithful to go when he was sent. And he found a spouse for Isaac while she was being faithful to do what she was supposed to do. God is always at work in the lives of his faithful people to bring about his redemptive purposes. And you know, sometimes following God means that we get to walk in sunshine on sandy beaches with suntan lotion and sit on the dock of the bay watching the tide roll away, right? That wasn't scripture, (laughs) y'all. But you know what? Sometimes that tide pulls us out, doesn't it? We get spun around in rip tides. And you know, God's at work in our lives. He showed me that this week. I was having lunch with uh, Charles Twitty, and we were talking about how life can spin you around. And he gave me something that I'm going to give you now. He told me about scuba divers sometimes can be out in the ocean and get caught in a riptide, and, and things get spun around, and it gets dirty, and you can't see where you're at. And if you're an inexperienced diver, your natural instinct is to fight and to try to find the surface as quickly as you can. And in doing so, in panicking, and trying to, to uh, save their lives, they lose their lives because they end up going the wrong direction. And so what an experienced scuba diver will do, they're taught to stay still. Be still and let the riptide pass. Let the, the uh, silt begin to... Settle and do what you know to do. What does a scuba scuba diver know to do? Breathe in, breathe out. Do what you know to do. Breathe in, breathe out, let it pass, and then watch where the bubbles go and follow the bubbles to safety. And maybe this morning you're a disciple of Christ and you've gotten disoriented. You've been taken down by a riptide. You know what God says to you? Be still and know that I am God. He says, go back to what you already know. And what is that? It's the gospel. Now, If you're disoriented right now as a a disciple, or maybe in the future you will be, here's a question you can ask yourself. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Ask yourself that. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? We know the answer is yes. 
Because if you need to ask that, because if Jesus rose from the dead, that means that he died for your sins. And if Jesus died for your sins, that means that he loves you. That means that he cares about you. That means that he is with you and he's working in your life. And because he rose from the dead, he's with you in your trial. Even in the valley, you are faithful. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good and for your glory. Listen, we need to... We need to understand this, that God is at work in our lives. Not only that, he's at work in your co-worker's life. He's at work in your spouse's life. He's at work in your enemy's life. He's at work even in the president's life. He is at work. And what we need to do in that truth, knowing that, we need to be faithful and do what we know to do. We need to be still. We've got to get alone with our God in prayer and in his word. You know, a computer has this function. It's called disk cleanup. Disk cleanup. Now, you go to disk cleanup when your computer's kind of not working very smoothly. You do that disk cleanup. And I don't know what it does, but it cleans it up. And for some reason, my computer runs better. That's kind of like what prayer and Bible reading do for our soul. This week, we need to spend time with God in prayer and in, 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 in his word. And if you're disoriented, don't make any rash decisions. Be still and be faithful, knowing that God is always at work in the lives of his faithful people to bring about his redemptive purposes. Amen? Amen. Amen.